is even more humbling to deliver it in front of so many who knew him best, lacking his great skills as an orator. When I was growing up and I needed help with a homework assignment or some other life task, I would go down to Dad's basement and seek him out and seek his advice. And it's that wonderful place that's been referenced here today, his basement office, that I want to describe to you as a tribute to him. By show of hands, who here has been down in that office with Dad? Me, me, me. <laughs> Dad's office was the heart of the house on Legation Street, a place where you could always find him writing his stories. In the early years, you could hear the clatter of his typewriter, the sound of jazz music, always on the radio, him playing the piano, or his crazy cat call cheering on a Redskins game. <laughs> Sam, what did Grandpa say when Redskins scored? <laughs> oh. <laughs> there was the smell of old books, coffee, or a pipe wafting up the stairwell to the kitchen. And making my last trip down those wooden stairs this past weekend, past cans of paint, and boxes of tools, and brushes my mother had accumulated as an artist over decades, ducking under welding masks and musical instruments, hanging from the ceiling, I had the chance to be reminded of so many memories there. Not really an office at all, but a corner of the basement which he had transformed in the place he did all of his work, and where you could see the tapestry of his life. One whole wall covered in photographs from his life, his family, all the beloved dogs of his life, those he got to know in his career as a writer or that he wrote about. Most everybody in this room had their picture in that office somewhere. His music, of course, always jazz playing on the radio, a drawer full of harmonicas. Dad would always buy one more harmonica on each trip. There's a bag of them here today that anybody wants to help himself. A piano against one wall, among his many talents was his self-taught ability to beautifully play the piano. I will dearly miss hearing those fun melodies coming up from the basement at all hours of the day and night. In one corner, boxes of cassette tapes from his interviews spanning 60 years. Recordings that future researchers will consider bonanza on the wisdom of 20th century indigenous peoples and elders. Odds and ends from his travels across the whole world. On one wall is an Israeli military police sign from the Sinai Desert that reminded me that he was often a witness to history. When I was in sixth grade, Dad was doing a story on the Sinai, it was mentioned earlier, and its transition back to Egypt after the Camp David Accords. And the day before he was to interview Egypt's President Anwar Sadat, he was invited by the President and the generals to a ceremony with a reviewing, uh, in a reviewing stand for a military parade. And in an event that perhaps ushered in the modern era of terrorism, one truck full of men armed with AK-47s and grenades stopped in front of the reviewing stand sprayed the crowd with automatic weapons fire and threw their grenades, killing Sadat and many more. Our family had known Dad was going to be at that event, and indeed was Dad was right there. People shot and killed all around him. I remember getting the news from my teacher that next morning that Dad had checked in at National Geographic and was okay. Many people here know that story about Dad being at that cataclysmic event, so I went back to his article in the April 1982 issue to see what he had written about it. I'll just set it up for you. I mean, he is a writer, he is a journalist covering a historic story, and in the middle of his coverage, in his immediate presence, this cataclysmic event happens. I would think most reporters would think they'd have their story written for him. So again, what did Dad write about that? Two sentences. In that many page article, there was two sentences about that event. But then Dad went on and said, quote, amid such lurching and violent change, I needed a handhold, something timeless to grasp, I found it among the ancient keepers of the land, the desert Bedouin. It was to become his hallmark as a writer, not to make his story so much about current events, no matter how important they seemed on the nightly news, but always to take it back to the story of the original peoples and their timeless traditions and those who carry those traditions for today, many of whom are sitting right here. Back in Dad's office, one shelf, on one shelf filled with philosopher's books, there's a bottle of Bailey's Irish cream. <laughs> As a teenager, I had traveled with Dad and Steve on that story about the desecration of ancient Shawnee burial mound in Kentucky. And back at the hotel that night, after interviewing archaeologists, Native Americans, politicians about this story, Steve and Dad shared that bottle of Bailey's Irish cream. It was my first time sharing an alcoholic drink with my dad. For years afterwards, I would always give Dad a bottle on Christmas, which we would share. In an hospital this past November, seeing that the end was near, I was able to sneak a bottle past the nurses to his room 
Oh. And we shared one last drink of okay. Bailey's orange cream. Mm. Near the Bailey's, a small gold nugget he had found with his metal detector reminded me that dad, of the trip I got to take with Dad on the Australian Outback story. It was the most classic of National Geographic articles, guides in khaki shirts and khaki hats and equipment tied to the outside of a land cruiser on the inside of a land cruiser. The days spent visiting Aborigine towns, which led to his book with uh, Dream Keepers. And camping out each night on the ground with only the light of the stars, the chirps and noises of a thousand insects and creatures. Camp was always made next to a billabong as a water source. Saltwater crocodiles lurking nearby. Dangerous saltwater crocodiles. Nervous about this exposure to all types of dangerous things, I looked at Dad, the veteran of so many international expeditions, to get a sense of security. Only to see that Harvey Arden, senior writer for National Geographic, had constructed a fortress of suitcases and camera bags around his sleeping bag. His <laughs> <laughs> defense against 14 foot crocodiles. <laughs> With that example, <clears throat> I spent the remainder of the month-long expedition tied on the roof of the Land Cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> on the wall separating his office from my mother's art studio is a whole, book of, whole shelf of books on the Holocaust. I think every writer has a novel in their mind that never makes it to print, and Dad's was a story on the Holocaust about a Catholic priest and a Hasidic rabbi evading the Gestapo during World War II. Even Dad had his work cut out for him tying that story together. Stationed in Europe myself, Years later, I had the opportunity to tour Dachau, but it wasn't until I visited Auschwitz with Dad and saw his visceral reaction at the gallows and the gas chambers, him spitting and kicking at the Arbeit Mach Frey sign, that I finally connected personally to that atrocity. Also in the office, of course, stacks of National Geographic magazines, including over two decades worth of his articles. His many books, Wisdom Keepers, Dream Keepers, Travels in a Stone Canoe, My Life is My Sundance, Noble Redman and others. Everyone knows Dad was generous to a fault. And I think he was the largest buyer of his own books, which he'd buy in bulk from the publisher <laughs> and then give away at readings instead of taking money for them, as was customary. <laughs> Many years ago, in speaking of the death of his own father, whom he rarely spoke of, Dad told me the only thing that his father had le ever left him when he died was a bottle of scotch. And it wasn't even a good bottle, it was just a bottle of Chivas. <laughs> and Dad being Dad, he absentmindedly left the bottle of scotch in the train in Chicago on the way back from his dad's funeral, effectively leaving him with nothing to remember his father. Though dad's office will no longer be there, when I think today of what he has left to me, to all of us who have experienced his love and generosity, and in tangible form, his books on our shelves, and a legacy that is chronicled in the archives of these buildings here at the National Geographic Society, where many of his works will be read by scholars coming here for decades and beyond. Think of what a great gift he was to all of us in life, and what a great legacy he leaves behind for us to learn from and emulate in our treatment of others, family, friends, and strangers. I know you just want to be remembered as a pretty good old white guy, mm -hmm. but we're remembered for so much more than that. Oh. 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 Oh.